What's up guys, Larry Chen here. We are at the base of Pikes Peak. This is another episode of Hoonigan Auto Focus, where we focus on some of the coolest autos in the world. This one especially is very cool. And we have the owner here, David Hackle. How are you? I'm doing fine, Larry. How are you doing this morning? Yeah, I forgot your coffee, sorry. No, it's okay, it's okay. So, uh, this is Monday morning, the day after the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb, where you actually competed in this, I don't even know what to call it, streetcar, rally car? Yeah, it's, it's, it's totally fine crazy. in Montana, totally fine in Montana. Yeah. Uh, Something crazy. Yeah. Uh, how, how did you do, by the way? How, how was your run up? We mountain? ended up sixth in class. So the goal this year, honestly, this was our seventh year. What we wanted to do was take out, well, not take, but displace Walter Rural's time, basically beat his 1047. And then we found out David Rowe had a 1043 and David's got a short wheelbase. This is a long wheelbase Quattro with widened fenders out of Germany, but that didn't happen. And we lost a motor two weeks ago. So we had to find another one in the room next door. And uh, so that owner I think knows about it at this point in time. So it'll be really exciting if we end up owning that one too. Um, or he maybe wants it back for um, Providence because he's a Pikes Peak motor. <laughs> that being said. Okay, so I'm just gonna say it outright. So I, I'm, I've been following the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb since 2011, since the last year of the dirt. I think my, one of my favorite shots from that hole event, actually I have two, um, is of Jeff Zwart in the uh, 997 GT2 RS, just swinging that thing around in the dirt with people so close, like they could basically high five him. Exactly. Right. They could touch his, the nose of his bumper. Yeah. Um, it was that car. And then it was a Subaru GC8. I forgot who was driving that. Um, but it, it, it just like, it felt like old school rally. Mm -hmm. it, there was no rules. And of course, since then, a lot of rules have changed. And of course, the whole mountain is paved. But you essentially are still bringing this rally car right. to this just all tarmac track. I, I honestly have to say, this is probably my favorite car this year. All right. Larry, I can't thank you enough for saying that because it's our favorite car and it's our favorite car because we grew up on these things. Yeah. So in the Midwest, uh, Quattro was a big thing out of Minnesota, the Quattro Club had started and as a youngster, just, well, it goes back to when I was six. And so that was on the Autobahn. Uh, we were there for the entire summer with my family. I've got 64 second cousins in Bavaria and we were screaming down the Autobahn and I was in the back of their 911s and it was just, that's what I wanted to do. And you know, when growing up, going fast, that was just, you get velocitized, so to speak, at a young age. And it was always just every little kid in matchbox cars and hot wheels. And then we got to this. And to tell you the truth, this car originally started as my daily driver, which was Ingo's car out of Michigan. And I had a pile of these things. I had like four or five of these original Quattros. And I said, well, it's rusty enough that we can cut it apart, paste, put it back together. And then I moved to Colorado in 2007 and I said, we're doing this. I said, because I had been over in Europe, I went to visit Karsten at Kerr and Novatech up in Nor um, Nordstemmen and he builds the panels for these. And every other wildest dream Audi that you want, S1, E2 replicas, Michel Mouton shorties, anything that you want, he can do it. And so we went up and visited him and he showed us around. He's like, anything that you want, I'll put it together for you. So the package was shipped literally to Chicago in 2007. I moved that February to Denver for work and I've never gone back because you gain years of age the more you move west. And so you being from California or in California, you're gonna live a long time. We'll be together for a long time. Uh, we cut it apart in 2012. Uh, we said, we're gonna do this. We took out the FIA rule book uh, for 2012 WRC specs and literally we went page by page, brought in um, chromoly from Germany specifically, oversized because if we're gonna do this on this mountain, which is 156 turn, rally stage tarmac, uh, rally tarmac stage, <clears throat> we want to be safe. So we just stripped it. I did it in my garage in Lakewood. I flew in these guys from across the country for uh, about six months on weekends and we force multiplied the numbers. So if you have five guys, eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, et cetera, you just do the math and we got stuff done and just kept 
every year has been an evolution. And so I was just talking to my wife this morning about 5 a.m. And she said, so do you feel good about where you did? And I said, well, we got an 1110. Two years ago, we got 1114, you know, from where we were. And we really wanted to be in the tens, but we're the only one in the class without arrow. And so we've been talking to many people and everybody wants to help really globally at this point because they love this car. It's the only one of its kind in the United States. And we're the only clowns that are sending it up Pike's Peak every year because it's in our backyard and we owe it to everybody else to do it. Um, sir, you're, you're just driving a box up Pike's Peak. <laughs> like, yeah, there, there's no, I mean, I guess, you could call this arrow. I'm not exactly sure how much downforce this is doing you. No, it's like the ducktail, the, the Porsche in the 70s. Uh, it, was, it has the bolt holes to put the oil cooler, which is what Audi had an oil cooler in there because they couldn't fit anything else. Because when the engineers went through it, they didn't leave you a straw's chance of putting anything else in the front. And there's nothing like driving a front end, or a f basically all your weight is forward. So the thing is tail happy. So they always send me up with 150 pounds of fuel in the back just to keep it settled, especially at the top end. And you know, I fight them tooth and nail because we wanted a 3.99 pound per horsepower car. We technically had it two weeks ago and it was amazing. Um, and that motor goes at Christmas time, it'll go back to our friend Jeff in Kansas to make it better again and we'll have it for next year. But yeah, it's a total box. It's literally crazy. It's a square. Uh, so your first, drive up the mountain was in 2012. I was lucky enough to be there to capture that. And that was actually the year a drift car won overall, that's if you could believe it or not. And, uh, and that that's kind of the thing about Pikes Peak is anything can happen on race day. I always say, you know, the mountain doesn't lie. She tells the truth. She'll let you go up if she wants. She'll give us good sunsets if we could be lucky enough to kind of receive those or clouds or whatever you know and for you guys it's good conditions and even yesterday the race was delayed by almost two hours due to ice i think at the top right yeah and larry i mean i know you love sunshine and good photographic images etc but there's every single year we at some point year in year out we're going to get caught in snow hail etc and i've been in a two-hour hailstorm up at the top when it rolled in i've got the footage from that from i think it's like two, 2017 Marcel was in, in the side with me, came down from the, from the finish line, and we literally had our feet off the ground as lightning was pounding around us. But that's what I asked for. Like, why can't we run in the snow? Because that would be awesome. It would just be the perfect race. It would just be literally like uh, Ken Block going sideways, but it's like we're on snow. You, I know for sure. I know there's rumors of it, and it's been something that's been talked about for a long time, but uh, actually de-paving or unpaving yep. uh, Pikes Peak, I think you would be probably the number one fan of that because you could do all-wheel drive slides, not that you don't right now, you could do all-wheel drive slides pretty much around every corner. Uh, let's just talk about the car. I don't know too much about this, so did this car ever come out in the US? It did, so 1980, well, and if you wanna know, maybe this is a fractured story, but you had engineers back in the late 70s uh, at, the, at the Arctic Circle and they were testing a, uh, the Iltis and that was the military car uh, Audi Volkswagen was doing for uh, the German military. Kind of like a Jeep, but ultimately a uh, power plant based on what they had at the time. And then they were thinking about a sedan, a turbocharged sedan, or maybe it was the other way around. I think that's the history. Ultimately, the two, the two people that were doing different projects were about 600 yards apart. They came and talked and they're like, what are you working on? Well, we're really working on this turbocharged sedan, et cetera. We're working on this military four wheel drive vehicle. And they said, why don't we go back to headquarters and ask if we can mate them? And that was the germination of what this Quattro was really, uh, kind of back of the napkin thought. And so they took pieces, parts, and we've got one of, one of the United States first people to drive, uh, Carl Baer, he drove a, a Quattro that was brought over as a test car in Michigan way back in the early 80s. And the son of the dealership owner in Michigan trashed it, well, basically just destroyed it the night before, uh, the first night they got it in the state. So it never made it to Colorado. But that being said, the original Quattro was basically born out of the idea of doing a GT perfectly done. It was still like a seven or eight second to six or six, seven seconds to 60 miles an hour in a five cylinder 10 valve. And it was a hit. They only brought over approximately, I would say it's less than 600 cars to the United States from 83 to 85, 84 is being the rarest. 
And then they came out with the Sport Quattro, and the Sport Quattro is even lesser of a build, which 12 inches out of it, a different rake of the uh, front windshield, and that's the one that Audi went to test with. Um, they went, dominated with this car, the long wheel-based original Quattro uh, in the 80s, and then they had to do, like Corsica, and they needed to cut it short. And Walter was really the only one who, as the teammates would say, could control that beast as, as, it, as it was. Um, but we just got inspired about it. And its handling is amazing. Uh, in a streetcar version, it's got center diff lock and rear diff lock with two different settings on the plunger as you pull out or switch however you had it. And it is just unstoppable. There's nothing, like we've got a 15% incline at the house up in the mountains and the F2350 can't get anywhere close and you put one of these in there, it just goes like a scalded cat up two feet, two feet of snow. So this, um, it's kind of fun actually to watch you drive by up on Pikes Peak because you kind of have to go gingerly around the corners, right? You're running, are you running street tires or are you running? No, those, well, those, yeah, those are kind of as close as you can get. They're not slicks, full slicks as next year with probably Hoosiers is what we're thinking of as we talk to friends who, who are, who are doing them. Um, but yeah, this wheel package, this was Brant Gladstone at Fixie. Uh, met him at the, met a friend of his at the table at Pebble Beach last year in 2019. And they said, uh, what do you do for, you know, for fun? I'm like, uh, I, I race this junk up, uh, <laughs> up Pike's Peak. And he's like, wait, I've seen that before. You need to talk to my friend Brant. He just bought Fixie Wheels. And so Brant and I got in touch and Brant said, I want my wheels on your car. The package came, you know, about four weeks ago. And they're seven pounds per corner lighter than the wheels we were running before. And it's just phenomenal it's just they look great they look period that's kind of the point right yeah and they were custom to what we wanted everything no more spacers no more anything it was our offset everything cut to what we wanted the look that we wanted the dish that we wanted it was just perfect and the three-piece forge so we're super excited about this um but as i was saying you're basically putt putting around the corners but then when you go on throttle it's like earth shattering yeah like that motor sings and on top of that it, it's just like it's like you do pull a wheelie almost when you accelerate even if you're on like a long straightaway and then it's just like screaming and then you shift and it goes back to screaming and you go back to like pop on a wheelie pretty much um it's it's so dramatic compared to pretty much all of the other cars up there like all a lot of the cars especially the fast cars rely so much on aero especially over the bumps right Correct. keep some planted and maybe they have a lot stiffer suspension than you i don't actually really know but it seems like just from watching you it seems like the it, it's more of like a rally setup it is it is and it originally was even crazier as a rally setup before we went to kw and so we don't even have a competition version yet that was a discussion we had last week when we thought you know at the end of cog cut we took the whole car sideways and went into a wallow and then we came back and the wheels were like this in the front and they're like what did you do and i was like i didn't do anything i just did what you told me just get to the top and we went back, got an alignment in Denver, and we called the head of Motorsports North America for KW. They took the call, which is exciting. Um, but we've been running them for years, and they said, well, you should really be on a competition package. The fact is, is that a car like this has to be a little bit loose. If you make it super stiff, it doesn't have the ability to just kind of walk over. And these are troughs, peak to trough, probably 12 inches at the top this year, uh, as far as yumps. And the car literally gets so light and catches air. But the beauty part about this thing is, there's a lot of trail braking for me that goes on at, at left foot braking that goes on at the bottom end and same at the top because you're in one gear that might not be right for that corner and you got to have that car be able to take a set and not be so like a stone skipping across the water and that's the fun part about it because it is responsive it is responsive if you know how to drive it just like a 911 if you lift throttle oversteer it's going to loop itself this one you can you can do crazy things with a quattro especially the setup i mean we've got an rs6 rear end on it um custom chrome molly uh, uh subframes custom chrome molly subframes that we had made in poland uh from albert and at the end of the day it's just the underpinnings of it just keep getting better every year because we've got everybody literally around the planet like giving us good ideas and wanting to see it continue well let's check it out yeah. if you could uh let's start off with uh, engine bay this is kind of the centerpiece of the car. So this is actually not your original motor that you wanted to run this year. Right. The other motor we had built uh, probably about three years ago, and we'd run it as a 2.5, uh, capable of over a 1,000 at the wheels. Um, the cranks are custom-made. Um, 
out of California, and we've also got the cams were out of Belgium. Um, so this is just a five cylinder that you could have bought in 93 to 95. Um, and so this, how many liters is this one then? 2.2. Okay. So this came in the 93 to 95 S4 and S6 motor. This one has pistons in it um, and rods and that's it. Uh, and we took actually the cams off the car, uh, off the motor that toasted itself two weeks ago. It didn't toast itself, it was running just fine uh, after one of our fastest runs in the midsection. And uh, Rob Holland and I were talking about it and we're like, yeah, we're just a little off. We're about, you know, seven seconds off what our times were last year. And the car's just idling, but there's just this, just little knock on it. Mm -hmm. And it turns out we, we took out, um, we took out all the electrodes on all five spark plugs. So there was three, three electrodes, so 15 of them kind of, some stayed in the motor and some went out the tailpipe, most likely. Uh, it ended up being a timing pin on the flywheel that grounded into the back of the uh, motor uh, down near the input shaft, which mushroomed that pin. And then it was going around and snap, nailed the timing sensors. And so our, our timing was way probably advanced ridiculously and um, got really, really, messed up but it still ran ran into the trailer ran around the block um testament to the first build um but so this one how much power does this one make this is putting out 450 at the wheels 452. It, that's so crazy to me because it's it seems like it's putting out a lot more when you pass by me it's really is the, the noise that this thing makes it makes all of the right noises yeah and that's the one thing as everybody Everybody remembers, even the Porsche crowd that comes over to talk to us in the pits, et cetera. They, some have had tears in their eyes in the past because the sound, it's that five cylinder sound that, and really when the turbo overspins and it's the chirp, which we don't have it set up for that, but you know, the stall, the, the compressor stall. And that sound is unlike anything else. Like a five cylinder on full song, it just has, there's just something about it. There's a couple things about this motor, um, or actually I've seen a couple Quattro's in Europe and one of the first things that really surprised me is how forward the motor actually is in the engine bay. And it's amazing to me that with that setup in terms of cooling, because that's kind of near the stock setup, right? Pretty much, yeah. It's amazing that it could keep this cool. Yeah, that was no problem. This, this is Dialing's radi radiator out of UK, and it's fantastic. I mean, they really did, Alred, they really did a great job on this thing. And this is an RS2 fan. So this is like a Porsche Audi hodgepodge of the real RS2 uh, that they built uh, back in the 90s. And so having that fan does all of the work. And there's an auto low and high uh, that kicks on. So we've never had a problem with that. Really, we've never had a problem with cooling, et cetera, on this thing. So I see why some people run without that headlight then. Yeah. Because absolutely. then it's just a lot more airflow. I mean, like looking at this, it seems like there's so much blocking that whole package. Exactly. We have yet to, we have yet to spend any time thinking about when it comes down to it. Uh, we've thought about it, but actually putting into practice when you come four weeks, eight weeks out, that's like the last thing on our list is to basically finally duct it because we haven't had any cooling problems. So our temps are really good, um, but we've got work to do for next year. And so that'll be ducting. And then what we're talking about is the dry sum system. Um, because when you're railing on this thing, more or less, uh, we've got an 8,500 rev limiter on the old motor. This one's down to 7,500. So my power band is really about 5,000 to 7,500. So to keep it in there, um, oil sloshing around and it kind of turns to water. So we're gonna send probably a bigger system to the back for cooling and we'll have to figure out, you know, the Europeans have done it for 25 years. Put the cooling in the back and go dry sump with it. And then we will have the ability, we could probably shove the motor, shorten everything back, um, a la Audi Sport. In the center, the center tunnel has direct bolt-in to the transmission, so we don't have any transmission wing arms anymore to hold it. So the car has gotten more and more structurally rigid within the cage. So the tub itself is feeling those stresses when we ran with the other motor. Hmm. And in, in terms of safety, what you're saying, like you guys really went all out in terms of tying in everything with the cage um, and plus like a legitimate fire suppression system. Yeah, I think the motor was more important for me than me uh, at this point in time. So we put two up there and then I'm like, let's put two on me and one in the back by the, by the fuel. But 
the uh, you know the sport the original sports had bracing that went all the way down to the front and that's another tie-in that we can still do because as stiff as it seems and it is pretty stiff we can definitely do a little bit more um, just so that the chassis holds together uh, a little bit better but it does have flex there's no doubt about it a lot of the cars when you see in super slow motion the whole body starts to flex well it's an old car i mean what year is this 37 one? years old 37 the oldest in class by 17 years this year amazing i mean <laughs> it's so cool to see this because like even the oil cooler right is this oil cooler yep it's like not that much smaller than that it seems like just from the naked eye you know yeah um and one of the things under acceleration and deceleration is, you know, you got that oil slosh. And so Audi basically figured it out by plumbing and having this, this system basically to catch. And so this is an oversized catch can that we custom did and it's got multiple baffles in it. And so it helps. And as soon as we did that, cause we've done everything but go to dry sump and been totally fine with the way that this is working. We have none of those issues, but as soon as we take that next step, there's really going to be nothing left to do other than, doing suspension and then what I was explaining to Margaret my wife you got to tune and aerodynamics is just as much tuning as tuning this motor you got one tweak here one tweak there and there's not many places to test it uh, on a flat track surface here out in Colorado so you can't you can't mimic that and you can't mimic the thin air either so how it's going to handle is going to be our challenge over the next 364 days hmm. uh, tell me about this tur turbo setup here so um, 3071 Gen X, that was new, new the year before last. It's fantastic. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's just sized right for the motor that we have. We could go to something a little bit larger, but yet has better spool. Um, and we still have to do another downpipe because the exhaust manifold, that one's been around. That actually got pulled out of another rally car that I had um, that still has that I use uh, on the ice during the winter. And that one has so many cracks in it, so we've got to redo and make it truly equal length. There's a couple, one or two pipes that are not absolutely perfect, um, so that's going to be done as well. But we've been really excited with working with Garrett over the years, and they're at this point pretty much at the point, whatever you need, just let us know. Well, let's talk about the outside a little bit. There's just so much to talk about. I'm sorry. I want to go so detailed in this because this is so interesting to me. Um, uh, I'll be honest, I don't know too much about Audis. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to really grow up around them. But I do have to say, in terms of modern Audis, the RS3 is my favorite because, oh my God, I've gone 185 miles an hour in one on the Autobahn and it had plenty left to go. So it probably could have gone 200. <laughs> yeah, and we talked about, we, we literally talked about this over the last couple of weeks, Larry, is that the 07K is the motor that came out with the TTRS, and it's long, you can get it longitudinal, longitudinal in the car. And that being said, but it's a different platform with its own issues, so to speak. And so the original five-cylinder motor, 20 valve, you know, we've just been picking up those motors over the years and storing them because to run this platform gets you that sound. The 07K doesn't have that sound. It has something similar, and David Rowe runs it as well uh, overseas as Keith Edwards does in their shorties, uh, their short versions, I just can't get away from that sound. And so to do that, we want to keep that, that platform as long as possible. And that was really a flagship. It, it debuted with like 227 horsepower back in, in the uh, mid nineties. That was, that was amazing. Um, but the car's capable of so much more. You really, really are so uh, uh, cognizant, I guess, of, the, of a byproduct that doesn't make you go any faster. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're really so, you that's something that you want to tune you know that's something that you want to keep and that's something that you are it's so important to you is this byproduct because i mean as you know the electric cars they don't make any sound at all and in fact they make a very annoying sound which is the sirens that they have to run um that's actually a safety thing for us so because we can't hear them coming around the corner if we can hear a little bit of a siren then we know they're coming around the corner but it's really cool that you're, it's so important to you. I mean, how could we say this? Everybody thinks I'm type A, uh, probably, uh, you know, there's some, there's some truth to that and everything has to be perfect. But eventually as you grow older, you have like more money than time. And when you're younger, you have all these dreams, hopes and, and things like that. And you have no money, but you've got all the time in the world. So 
having grown up with a car family and all the relatives in Europe that I've been over there almost every year since 1976. And every year I'm renting now that I'm older, renting the car just to test, you know, an Audi product, BMW product, just to go around and we're carving canyons. We're carving, uh, down in Austria as well. We're doing whatever we can just to see what's going on. But it all comes back to this. This is kind of feels like home at this point, And it's taken years to make sure that this, this is like a glove to me is as so much as I have a regular street version that we were using in winter because the pedal setup, the same muscle memory, everything's in the exact same location. And so at that point, the heritage is so important. And maybe that's part of the Bavarian culture that I grew up in, but it's so important because this is, seems to be a forgotten, everybody harkens back to it and they think about it and we see it for advertising purposes, but it is still amazing that, that we can keep something like this and preserve it. And FanFest about five years ago, husband and wife came up from South America just to see this car. And so the car's important, like not, not the clown behind the wheel. It's, it's literally, this represents something to kids that says, you can do this. We did it in a garage. Granted, it's been refined over the years, but you can do this. And all he wanted to do was get down and touch the car and then have me sign his little, his, his rally gloves uh, from South America. And I was like, you know, I was almost moved to tears because he was in tears. And at that point, it became very, very important to me to make sure that other people, there's still some, some things like this going around. In Germany, Sweden, Switzerland, everybody's got something like this going on. It's just in the States, it's, it's the ability to get close to it, touch it and hear it. And this place is the perfect place to display it every single year. So we'll keep doing it as long as they keep inviting us. All right, so the outside, a um, couple things. So t tell me a little bit about this. This can't be stock. No, so it originally came with box flares. Everybody loves box flares. Whether it was on like the Peugeot, whether it wasn't, well, actually the Mitsubishi Starion has some killer, killer lines to it. Um, but it originally came with box flares on it. They were um, formed as well so they actually have direct shelves into them and they're more angular these are the wide bodies and so deep. is this metal no it's fiberglass okay you can get it in carbon fiber as well fiberglass is a little bit easier to work with if you get something uh if you ding it up or you crack it or something like that but like it lines up so well yeah because this a lot is all work. stock or this can't be this stock. came this is like a sport quattro front uh and same as this as well, and the hood and the fenders. That's what the Sport Quattro had, but that was carbon Kevlar Aramid, and that was specially made for Audi. And so a quarter panel from Audi, if you still own a Sport Quattro, and I might be going out of school here, but if you can't get parts for it in the United States unless you have the VIN number for it and you own it. And so if you show Audi that and you need a new carbon Kevlar, yeah, you'll spend seven grand. They'll overnight it to you and uh, it'll be here. Wait, it's actually from Audi? This is not from Audi. This kit we bought from uh, Kerr and Novatech in Nordstrom in the north of Germany. And so he does replicas. Oh. And so, but that is an exact copy that's off a buck from a Sport Quattro, the whole wide body in the rear. So everything is grafted. This is just bolted in. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's going to be some, every kit that you buy across the planet is going to have some fitting issues, which you can fill in or, and in 2012, we were like 45 days out for the race. So we're like, yeah, let's get the release, the reliefs uh, better on the hood than the quarter. But this was all, so this was originally box flares back. You actually have to cut a section of metal out and then you lay these in over and you use a 3M product basically to, to, to seize it in or basically um, fuse it together and then sheet metal screws hold it for 24 hours and then it comes off and it is literally like rock solid <laughs> it looks great though yeah, i mean it, it took me... i can't actually tell where it was put on right yeah which was the process and going out and inhaling um inhaling fiberglass resin for about 25 days in the garage at night i would go out there and i would just hand sand just to different levels to make sure that that feather edge you would never be able to see it um all the way back here and then you tie it in this is all still uh down here this is part of the original Back here is all hand blended in, including this. This is still fiberglass, and oh well, yeah, you can okay. See so you, this is like how wide it, yep. how much wider it is. Yeah, and so the original factory one is like right there. Oh. Uh. So that gives us the ability to run 10-inch wide wheels at this point in time because we just had this quarter. Um, the mold that it was taken off of in Germany was slightly off, so it was in probably about an inch. And so what we did probably about two months ago 
Uh, we had some friends out here that are just amazing with restorations. They actually feathered this out and pulled it and matched the other side. And so now we can run whatever size we want uh, and it, it looks pretty good. It actually looks like you can even go a little wider now, no? Yeah, we're thinking about it. Yeah, because right here, these wheels were running basically a size smaller, 255s. We can probably go 265, 275. And where the maximum amount of contact patch that we can get will help uh, as we keep raising the power. We're not going to stop at 550 because it's got so much capability and it still wants to breathe. Um, so whatever we can get. This is kind of neat. So is this like a... This is the factory. This is the way they had it at the factory minus this. So in a Sport Quattro that's widened like this, but a Sport Quattro has 12 inches cut out of it, it's shortened and the windshield rake is actually moved forward. And so in order to make a shorty, which we're going to do, we're gonna have probably two or three more made in the mountains. Um, I'll have the garage built up there at our place uh, sometime June of next year. And we'll be able to shove all the collector collections that I've got over the years, the Porsches, the old Audis, things like that, put them in one place and have them on display. Um, that being said, cutting that out and moving it, this was an original gas flap for the car, whether it was the original stock 83 or it was the Sport. And so we just decided that was the easiest place closest to the battery. That's so cool. Yeah. It's like functional. It's still, you know, a, a button or a, to, to shut off. We the power. thought, yeah, we thought about putting it back to an original gas tank uh, to allow us to fill from here. But yeah. <laughs> and what, what does the license plate mean? So it means mischievous. If you go back in really old German dictionaries, some people would say unholy. Uh, there is something completely, uh, and witchcraft is in there as well. When you drive the mistress that's called Quattro, there is a certain mystique about it and you have to, you have to be able to handle it because it's got some crazy things that it can do if it's driven in the right way. And not necessarily anger, but there's a little bit of finesse and it will do things that just blow your mind. And this is one of the places that we test that out every year. And you have to creep closer every single year. This year got a little hairy when we were going. We just happened to be in the right place at the right time, placement on the track, and we shot up towards uh, the straightaway at the top, second straightaway at the top towards Cog Cut. And I was literally going faster than I've ever gone in the last seven years. And that corner is coming up, and that's that be, doesn't necessarily become a kink as it looks like a 90 and you're just gonna fly off the end of it. So I had to bring it back and I had to break uh, for the first time because I think if I didn't, and we had hail, we had a little bit of grapple, a little bit of snow, and just needed to hold on. That was a real pucker factor for this year. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, I really like the livery too. It's very simple. Um, it, what is that like? A That's a crest from the Donau Ries region in uh, Bavaria. So all the family, the family that lives over in Baden-Württemberg, wonderful, awesome, my mom's side. Uh, that the base is in Bavaria. So the massive amount of family that I have is there. And the Donau Ries, that's a specific cow, cow town area, small towns, and super close to, to all things cars. So in the south, you've got Roof, you've got Ingolstadt, that's a little to the east. Um, there's not a year that we don't go by the museum and check out Audi. In fact, going there to get hats for these guys, I get them swag every year that I go because I've got the opportunity to do so. And so going there the guy behind the counter said oh so you like audis as i'm buying up all the historic 85 rally hats you know that they wore for michelle and, and walter and some of the swag and he said oh yeah so you like to do and I said, oh yeah the guy that helps Audi that does the the kits and and puts the factory cars back in shape he said he lives down right the street he's a friend of mine and he's like here's his number let's call him see if you can get lunch with him so tried to get in touch with him and have lunch that day he wasn't available but that's on the ticket for next year when there's no covid <laughs> That's so cool. I just, it's just so simple, but it adds so much to, to this livery or, or to this, the look of the car. Um, and you have Porsche brakes, which is kind of cool. Stays in the family. Yep, absolutely. We have box dress, uh, fronts and rears. And so those handle, they'll handle all capability for years. I mean, we could go with big reds, but when I showed up in 2012, I had the original 15s. So they were R8s. And those are like 30 spokes and ET of 24, et cetera. The fact is I was on like 10 year old rain tires because I didn't have anything else. What else did we have? And we really had no options to run what was stock. And I was in 2012 or two, yeah, 2012. We, we were the only car without any sort of slick or near slick. Everybody at that point, even eight years ago, now that I think about it, 
they were all set up and we were just these new kids. Uh, what was your time in 2012? I think we put down like a 1250, 1240, something like that. That's not bad for street tires. No, and the best part about it, it was, it was, it was, well, we didn't. 2012, I think we made it, I'll have to think back. 2012 was the year of the fire, so they moved it to August. Yeah. And I think we, we made it halfway. We got timed out because Jeremy Foley had his incident. Oh, that's way worse than last year. Yeah, Jeremy went off. He was two cars ahead of us. We were shut down for five or six hours. And so at that point, it was rain, hail, and snow, and we got halfway. So they cut us at Glen Cove. And so at that time was probably like six something, I want to say. And we were completely sideways, and it was awesome. A total barrel of monkeys before we even had GoPros hooked up to it. Um, but then we moved, uh, got some better tires over the years. We were running like Hankook's RS3s, things like that. But it was still 15 inches, so we were running a modified Sport Quattro front rotor with a special, um, still big uh, Boxster brakes, not Boxster S at that point. And so that was the only thing that would fit under a 15. Now that we moved to 17, we have options. And then, like I said, we could do big reds, but that's more stopping power than you ever need on this mountain. I know people get really overbraked uh, for this and it just, it's, it's just extra, extra weight. There's so many cool things to talk about. So um, like these are Lexan. Yeah. Right. But the front is still oh yeah. Still a factory piece of glass. So that was one of the last pieces of glass. Um, I was working on the car. I was working on the this car back in 2013 in the garage, and a tool dropped on the windshield. Oh. And because you can't get them anymore, and if you find them, they're like hen's teeth, and you just have to stock up. I had a friend W. G. Giles who was a national uh, production rally um, champion in the 90s, and uh, W. G. had one of the last pieces of glass in his closet in the original bubble wrap from Audi, and he was coming out to Steamboat to run ice driving with us as well. And W. G. drove this thing across country in the back of his car, and we had a new windshield. And Haggerty was already insuring the car back in that time, and I called him, and they said, "So what happened?" I was like, "Yeah, tool fell and snapped the corner." And uh, she said, all right, so we can't find any of these. And I said, yeah, we'd have to go to Europe. And we've tried to do deals with Audi uh, Historic before, and they wanted, like, for 30 windshields, like $15,000, and there's no guarantee that it's going to come over unbroken. So this one, they said, whatever his gas costs are, whatever his fuel, his any lodging, we'll pay for all of that and the windshield. And I was like, that's totally an awesome insurance company. So... This has been the same windshield since then, and hopefully we don't snap another one. I had the last one, another last one that was in Ohio about six months ago through PPG Classic, and it got destroyed by uh, one of the unnamed two big companies that delivered it, came shattered in the box. Oh no. So I'll have to take a trip over, uh, probably in spring of next year to Germany, get some contacts together, bring a crate over, something like that, because I'm not the only one that's in need. Hmm. Um, I noticed there's no e-brake. No, unfortunately. It would be nice. What's going on with that? How's it, how's it that there's no e-brake? It's a single channel that runs to the back. Um, and so to plumb that in, we used to have it. And at this point, it's really not necessary anymore. And it was just, there was a bunch of um, metal associated with this, just weight. And so we really don't need it anymore. So hmm. we just took it out. So none of these ever had an e-brake to go around corners easier? They did, absolutely. The factory one sat right here. There was a long handle here. And you just yank on it, and you can totally do your parking brake turns. And it's and it disconnects the front, or how just, does that work? It just goes right to the rear. Okay, it was so connected. It was connected by cable to springs that just tugged on the brakes back there. So then, what would you do? You would just clutch in and then pull pull it. You could do that, or you could even stay in it and then just pull it. And you know, there's there's video of, of the professionals for Audi as well, uh, Walter and Stig and Michelle, etc. They you don't see so much of it but they did use the handbrake quite a bit because it was much more efficient than you know heel toe down shifting and f you know slamming the car. you don't have all the room necessary to do the wags in some of the corners so it's just lift the e-brake hmm. interesting and because um because of the center diff it basically allows it almost mm -hmm. to to lock up more versus the front yep so, I mean, you could lock the center and then you have 50-50 weight distribution, or 50-50 brake force distribution, sorry. Um, you could do that and then the car, 
when you lock this, we don't have that ability anymore. So now we've got basically a torsion, uh, torque sensing uh, diff, and then the rear is the RS6 uh, rear end of that. And we've got a wave track in there. So things are doing, it's a lot different. It's, there, there's more, they're friction devices, it's no doubt. And so you don't have so much control over just locking at 50-50. And you could even lock up the rear diff in the old, so it's exact rotation on both sides. And that's what we do at Steamboat. So the cars that we do use there uh, on ice, we definitely play with that because coming out of the corner, you just have this, everything's moving forward, just clawing like a scalded cat. Um, so is this a stock transmission then? This is an O1E. So the stock transmission was a 389, um, five speed from Audi with the 10 valve. Now that we've moved to the 20 valve, we were running, we moved to a 411, uh, which gave us a little bit more grunt out of the corners. But the stock limit on a 411, which came in Audi 4000 sedans, normally aspirated in the 80s, like we were putting down 550 in that. And people in Europe, basically, we weren't blowing them up. And they're like, how are you doing that? Well, you have to be really ginger on your application of throttle and just don't abuse them. And they were blown away that we were still running a stock because you could find them in junkyards if you're lucky and just pulling 411s out of the junkyard. So now that we move to an O1E, it doesn't shift as well, but that's more of a modern 90s transmission, if you will, and it's a totally stock transmission at this point. So what did it actually come out of then? This came out of uh, basically the sedans. So you're talking 93 to 95 S4, S6 sedans, and you can find these all day long. And so that's the nice part about it, but it will get some different gearing ratios for next year that probably will help better match what's coming out of the engine bay. Um, this cage is absolutely crazy. Like, wow. Um, I mean, you mentioned Jeremy Foley, like we've seen, you know, cages and safety equipment save lives. Uh, this is really, really, really stout. I mean, we kept, we kept going back to the drawing board and we were looking at it. And as we went through page after page of the book, the FIA spec book of what they wanted, we just kept going a little bit further further and we're we're literally in a garage at two in the morning in lakewood and i mean the reason it fits as well as it was was because the attention to detail so the former owner of the house that i had with 2500 square foot garage had a lift he inherited a bunch of lolas and and sports cars and a, an amazing company that does mandrel bending it's here in denver and he does aircraft and aerospace bending and so this was done on SolidWorks. So we sat in here for hours and hours and measured, and then we put it in SolidWorks, tested it, and then we had blueprints made of every single one, and we took it to Eric, and Eric's like, yeah, I'll totally do this. And he came back, and everything just fit in like Lincoln Logs. It was absolutely perfect. And then we MIG welded it after talking to Lincoln uh, Motorsport Welding, a program that I actually went through a couple of years. No, it was about 20 years now. I was had a vacation. I had some extra vacation. I'm like, I want to get welding certified. And so we did that. But the cage was actually welded by my neighbor who was a Marine um, or a Navy welder um, and he had gone through their program. And we just sat there, cut and pasted. This used to have a sunroof. And so if you look at the top, it's really hard to tell because I spent so much time putting a cut piece of curved exactly, maybe it's a 16th or a little bit thicker. And then we sat there and I sanded it for what seems like days to get rid it's of so any- smooth indication <laughs> I, yeah you can only tell if you look underneath right? yeah that's the plate that i sat there and just hand ground and uh cut up stock dash that is yeah later style so this is the dash that came in the late style uh so it would have been an 84 and 85 for the urqs uh or quattros and so we did that and then added the aim a couple years back um, still the stock blower in there i wanted heat um but more so these years, I don't need heat, I just need defrost. That's the same pedal alignment that came in 83, everything's the same. Um, we've changed out steering. It still has a heater core then over here? Yeah, we're not putting, There's. I don't think there's one in there at this time, it's oh. just a blower. Oh, okay, a blower, okay. And what's this? So that's our new addition for this year and I couldn't be more excited. So to tell you that it's been a challenge to stay relevant in time attack when cars show up are 1.25 million. 77 of them don't necessarily, that go into private hands mean it's, and you can edit this out, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a production car because in Europe there was 12,000 of these made, the original Qs. And so there's plenty of them that have gone around. So as a homologation type of thing, but this comes out of a GT, uh, GT3 
RS Cup Car Porsche um, electric steering. So for the last four years, I haven't had any power steering. It's all been manual. So we've been using a Volkswagen 70s Fox rack. And I can tell you, as I've talked to Jeff Zwart a couple times, he's like, you got some muscles, man, um, to be able to like go through those corners because you have to plan ahead just to steer. And it was just a beast of a, a machine. And so this year is the first time we installed it. It's all custom, the work that we did. We ended up in a, in a yard and we pulled out a 98 Audi Cabriolet rack and had it rebuilt to brand new. It was tough for them to find the specs for it, but it has, I think it's like one and a quarter lock to lock on each side. Um, basically less than three turns lock to lock back and forth, almost two and a half at this point. And it is fingertips. It is truly amazing. It sounds like a jet fighter. When you fire it up, you have to wait for it. And it's got this whine that slowly climbs and then you know you can use the steering, but it is the best addition we have made. It's the craziest thing to me that this is such a hodgepodge of all Volkswagen Auto Group parts, <laughs> but you've like all made it work. It's like a hybrid of all of the companies. You have to be able to nerd out. And so the fact that we've got aerospace guys from um, Ball, et, et cetera, and former engineers and, and, well, you're always an engineer. You're just less, uh, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we've got really smart people that think about the systems and, and part of those systems Everyone has to work integrally, uh, and to get to 14,000 feet, the pressure ratios that you're running in the motor, the heating, the cooling, the steering, the, the forces on the car are literally trying to tear it apart. And so when we think about things, the fact that we're into the Porsche um, bin of spare parts makes us happy because we know that there's a ton of engineering that went through, and these are remanufactured at this point. So to get a new one, I think it's a couple thousand dollars, and so you can pick up um, refurbished ones as well and just stock them. Well, thank you so much for showing us pretty much every little bit of this car. Um, I can't wait to see this thing up next year. And honestly, I just can't wait to see this again because uh, this is truly like car culture, just in its purest form. And you're just trying to keep it alive. Instead, you could easily, you said off camera before, you could easily get a 911, a GT car, from the factory or whatever, a K-Man or anything, and you can destroy your own time and be very competitive, but uh, you would rather just drive this thing. Yeah, Larry, you totally hit it on the head. We could run any chassis we wanted to, I mean, within reason, but we definitely have the opportunities to run with Porsche, and it's nice to have parts galore and just go to the counter and get stuff. But at the end of the day, this represents something bigger than that. And we knew that when we built it in 2012, it was gonna be a 10 year program. It was gonna be an evolution to try and get to where we wanted to be, which we wanted to be in the nines. And to be almost close, you know, I had to back off on the top section this year considerably. And I, I did say earlier that cooling wasn't a problem. We had oil temps on this new motor that's literally um, hours old. We had some temps, so I had to back off for the whole top section. So right when we got to Cove and we got some hail, rain, a little bit of snow, and temps basically went through the roof. I'm like, do I toast this motor as well, or do we keep going? And I said, I wanna make this, I wanna finish this because it's been such a journey this year. So we held off a little bit. And so that was probably the record maybe, or getting close to Walter's time in 87. But at the end of the day, it's, we know this is a, a longer program and that means we have people from all over the country and all over the world. Like I said before, we've got space engineers as well that throw stuff in the air and circles the globe and continues past Pluto. And they've got their eyes on this and they're part of the team. And because we have to think about pressure ratios at 14,000 feet, we have to think about all the, th the effects of the environment that's really trying to tear the car apart. And we're going to get there. It's just, we're late to the party with aero. And it's like, but that's baby steps. You don't want to come in with a car that's already built that has way more capability than you. You drive within your limits and you never try to go to 11 tenths because most people who are up there at 11 tenths, they don't even know they were there and then they've backed themselves into a tree or off a cliff or something like that. And we just want to take it one step at a time. And that's part of building a successful program and a car that basically can be this old and will and will continue to be in the pack. Yeah, well, honestly, you're inspiring people. You're inspiring, hopefully, others to kind of run a, a program similar to yours to attack the mountain or just 
I don't know, get into racing in general with older cars, right? It's, it's too boring. It would be too boring if everyone had the same car up there, you know, and that's kind of one of the reasons why I love Pikes Peak because yeah, you have the $20 million, whatever, however many million dollar Volkswagen IDR next to something like this or next to another garage built something that's um, uh, either driven to Pikes Peak or trailered in an open trailer, yeah. you know, versus you, you got something that's flown over from Germany in a 747 you know it's the it's the craziest thing it's so cool to see both at the same race attacking the same mountain it it is and we're indebted to you and pike speak and everybody for basically capturing the stories and capturing the memories and telling the story because this is one one of the last races in america where you run, run what you brung type of thing and a lot of stuff is garage built and to be in the same category as people who get paid get flown over, you got wine and cheese parties, this, that, and the other thing, and basically they're do doing testing for manufacturers all day long, and then they're racing professionally, and they're trying to do family and friends, all that. It's like, you're right with them, and they're so nice. You know, the fact that you've got, Reese Millen is like, he loves this car too, because of his, you know, he's basically had his RX years ago, and to have that still popping up in the day when you've got $1.25 million cars showing up with all the factory support, et cetera, it's fun just to be in the mix. And that mix actually shifts every single year. This was a year of attrition with COVID and certainly a lot of people had issues and a lot of people from all over the country had altitude sickness issues, they've got car issues. You don't know what you're gonna get into and that's the beauty of it. And so we owe it to everyone else to continue the program and inspire people globally because again, it's too much fun. It's so much fun. Mm. And that's why I always say this is like the bucket list race, you know? This is the one, if you want to experience something incredible, you definitely have to come to Pikes Peak. I think that's a wrap.